Hebrews in chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there are a lot of them available around the room. They are the black, uh, the black book that's either in the seats around you, or if uh, you're next to somebody that you can share one with, that's the uh, black book. We want you to have a Bible because we want you to know that what we preach is the Scripture. Let me get you one, brother. Right. Oh, chapter 4. Yeah, oh, I thought you were asking for a Bible. Okay. Anybody need a Bible? Hebrews chapter 4. Yes, ma'am. All right. The uh, unique distinctives of a church like this is that we bring Bibles to church. And that almost sounds like a sarcasm unless you've been somewhere and realize that that isn't what all churches do. And you know, we think that it's always been that way, but it isn't. It isn't simply because uh, we're not able to uh, put the, the Bible up on the screen or whatever, but it's because this book is your book. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, knowing this first, that no prophecy is of the scriptures of any private interpretation. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Sometimes, sometimes uh, we fall prey to the notion that God gifts some people with truth that he withholds from us. And you say, Pastor, I don't really believe that. No, but sometimes we think that some people, you know, they just, you know, I don't, they, they're smarter than me or they're more educated than me and so they must know something. Maybe just because it doesn't make sense to me, maybe it's just because they understand something that I can't understand. Well, it is true uh, that an unspiritual Christian doesn't have things revealed to him by the Spirit of God or he has a hard time understanding truth because of spiritual immaturity. But if you seek God and desire to know God and want to know truth, my friend, you'll come to the same conclusions that anyone else who is honest and studies the Scripture comes to. We want you to know that this book is written for you and God intends for you not only to know what is in it and to know it, but to know it with confidence, knowing that you do know God's Word. And man, I'll tell you something. We need some confidence in a few things, don't we? Eternal life being one of them. Do you know that you know that you have eternal life? Amen. That's the most important thing in the world is having confidence that heaven is your eternal home and that it cannot be taken from you. And uh, so we want you to uh, want, we want to emphasize uh, the scripture. Secondly, it's it's good reading. So we want you to have a Bible because that secondly it's good reading. If you get bored with my preaching, <laughs> at least you can have your Bible open and read something good, right? I hope uh, I, I'm joking about that. I hope that isn't the case this morning, but uh, it's always a backup plan. Hebrews chapter four. <laughs> Will you please look with me down to verse one? And uh, we'll read our text this morning. I have several texts I wish I could read, but for sake of time, I cannot. The author of Hebrews, who I believe is the Holy Spirit, I think you'll agree, said, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And then verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And then let's go down to verse 9, will you please? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Verse 10, For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from His. And now will you please go with me down to verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight, speaking of God, but all things are naked and open in the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And now pay special attention to verse 16, will you please? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Father, as we at this minute enter into the throne room of heaven where you are, we acknowledge first your holy presence, we acknowledge our own unworthiness, and we also acknowledge the finished, complete work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And God, I pray that in a very, very real sense, a very real way, we would come to an understanding of the right way that we ought to enter into your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now before we explain our text this morning, uh, I would like to just bring us to where we're at. This is sort of, if you will, the uh, finale for our series, sermon series on worship. And, uh, if you haven't been here the last several weeks, I hope, uh, Brother Tony, could you make sure that you get the worship series, the five weeks, all kind of put into one category together. Tony will have that up on YouTube. A lot of it I think already is, isn't it? And if you could just make sure that it's accessible on YouTube. Find us on our Facebook page. Uh, it's uh, Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, I think, just Facebook page. And Tony will have a link there for the worship series. You need to catch up on it because worship is something that we begin our series by saying that if we were to ask the average Christian uh, to write an essay on worship, I think we could write not only a paragraph but maybe a page. And for some of us, maybe could write a book explaining about worship. But if we were to take a test on worship, most believers would fail. In other words, we, we, we have a lot of we have beliefs about worship. We have a lot of notions about worship. But when it comes to understanding what worship is simply defined in the Scripture, most believers don't have a clue about what worship actually is. And if worship is the true sense of what we were created to accomplish, for God, if worshiping God is what our life's purpose is, and if we do not understand the simple definition of what worship actually is, then my friend, we're all kind of missing our life's purpose. We're created to worship God. We're created for His glory. And yet most of us have so many notions about what worship is and so little actual understanding of what worship is that we're just plowing through life uh, haphazardly thinking we're worshiping and actually not. And so we saw uh, in the scripture, we saw worship simply defined. And by the way, you could do the same thing. There are some, some times when just taking a Strong's Concordance and studying words is very profitable. And you could look at worship in the Bible and look up every instance of the word's usage and you would see that there are basically three words that are derivatives of worship, and every single one of them simply mean to bow, to actually bow down. And so worship defined uh, is, is literally the physical act of bowing. Most churches corporately do not worship, though maybe some do individually worship. I do think, this is my opinion, and I don't know that I'm exactly right about it, but I think that the invitation at the end of the service, where oftentimes a lot of churches would have people that would come forward or respond where they're at or go back, or a years past would actually go into uh, rooms that were set aside for people to kneel, to bow before God, and to respond to the truth in the invitation. I think that a lot of that came from when you've seen God, when you've seen God's truth, and you've seen yourself in the mirror of God's Word, your response is, wow God, and oh me. And your natural response is to bow to God. And I think that's where a lot of uh, the response to seeing God comes from. Worship is, actual worship is a response to seeing who God is. The illustration we use, we're going to use a second one, the illustration that we use to help us understand worship came from really our series on biblical separation. And we looked at Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah describes seeing God. And he said that he saw God high and lifted up. And he described the presence of God in the temple. And he described the angelic beings that were flying around the temple. He described the throne room. He described where God was sitting. And the understanding that Isaiah had of God when he saw him was that God 
is here, and he is here. In other words, his response to seeing God was, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a generation of unclean lips. And when you realize what you are, and you realize what God is, my friend, the natural response is to bow, to fall down on your face and say, God, you're worthy, and I'm altogether unworthy. Now, friend, you may say, Pastor, that doesn't make me feel very good. You'd be surprised how good it feels to worship God. Mm. See, we, we're all the time trying to assert ourselves. We are taught by our society not to take uh, any humbling or not to allow anyone to put us down. And I think that oftentimes we've been so inundated with that notion and that concept that we think that we're God's equal. And nothing could be further from the fact. God is a creator, and we're the created. God is holy, and we're unclean. Uh, God is love, and my friend, we love ourselves. Everything about God is polar opposite from us, and in every way, God is superior to us. Last week, I was watching some videos I think on YouTube, I'm not sure how it came up, but Melissa, I was watching some, Melissa came over to watch because I was watching responses of guys who were in court when they were being sentenced. And uh, I, there was a guy, oh, I know, it was a news article last week, a guy, I think it was in one of the I Midwestern, the, one of the Midwestern states that begins with I, Iowa or Indiana or Illinois, one of those states, I can't remember which, but he was sentenced by, he was being sentenced by a judge and he wouldn't shut up. And so the judge had him duct taped. You guys see that news last week? Kind of so I went and watched the video, and I thought, well, that'd be interesting. The judge had the guy's mouth duct taped shut. And he had a real problem recognizing, this man had a real problem. He got 40 years, too. I think he should have shut up. Uh, he had a real problem recognizing the authority. Or the judge had the right to sentence him. And he said, you need to understand where I'm coming. He just wouldn't stop talking. The judge is saying, you'll get to speak. You'll have a chance to speak right now. Do you understand? Be quiet. Do you understand? I think he said nine times, told him to be quiet, and finally he just had the deputies duct tape his mouth shut. And I thought about the man, and I thought, you know something, I've talked to him a lot, actually. I, I, I completely understand where he's coming from, and I've met him on many occasions. The person that won't listen. And I'm not talking about just won't listen, but the person that thinks you don't have the right to tell them anything. And we have an overinflated ego. We have a, we really literally... Uh, are just taught, and I think it's just, I think it's it's a deceptive lie of the devil. We're taught that nobody's better than us and nobody's over us. You know, authority doesn't mean somebody's better than you. Authority's just authority. God made authority. You're an authority, and you're under authority, and, and that's the way it is. But God is God. And we have a real problem just bowing and just saying, okay, God, my friend, you'll be vexed, you'll be frustrated, You'll be angry in life unless you come to a place where you can just say, yes, Lord. And just recognize, God, you're worthy to be worshipped, and it's right for me to bow before you. Hey, listen, you don't believe me, try it. Try it. There is nothing more fulfilling than worshipping God. Now you say, Pastor, I don't think so. Well, because you don't know. That's what we're made for. We're made to worship God. And no person is right. No person feels right. No person is settled until he's come to a place of worship. Okay, so we saw worship defined. We saw uh, fallacies in worship. And the fallacies of worship were that worship, and, when I'm and here I'm generally speaking of worship in the church, that worship is self-centered instead of God-centered. Or we could say that the perspective of worship is our perspective versus God's perspective. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean, generally speaking, most believers determine how they worship God on the basis of what they want to do. In other words, I've heard a lot of people say, this is how we worship God in our church. Haven't you? Uh, does, uh, do most churches have distinctive worship like there, you could say the worship in this church is like, and you could define it. You could say this is how we worship. 
Most churches do, don't, don't they? Yes, they do. Now let me ask you a question. If God defines worship, then how could it be different from church to church? If God says this is how worship ought to be, shouldn't it be the same everywhere you go? In other words, worship means bowing, doesn't it? If people are worshiping, shouldn't it look the same? I, I saw a picture that illustrated this, and it was kind of tragic. It was in a pretty good work book. There aren't very many good books that really define worship a biblical way, but it had a picture to illustrate it, and it showed a picture of a mosque, and it showed everybody bowing, and then it showed a picture of a church, and it showed people rocking out with Jesus. Which is worship? Neither. Because bowing to a false god is not worshiping the true God. But rocking out with Jesus isn't worshiping either. Both are right. They're not worship. What is worship? Worship is bowing before holy God in heaven. In other words, you can be on this side of the perspective and be wrong, or on this side of the perspective and be wrong, but you're still wrong if God doesn't define worship. The illustration for worship that we used, uh, or that we saw, was the woman at the well. And before she came to know Jesus, she had a theological question for him, and it really was a nationality question. She was Samaritan, and the Samaritans were abused and mistreated a great deal by the Jews. And uh, also had reasons why they were abused and mistreated by the Jews as well. And so the Samaritans worshipped in the mountain, and the Jews said that they were supposed to worship at Jerusalem. And she brought that up to Jesus. She said, you know, our fathers worship in the mountain. We believe God's a spirit. And so we think that God's everywhere. And can't you, if God is everywhere, can I worship Him in the mountain? And Jesus' response to her, you would think, would have been a good point. God is a spirit, and so you can worship God anywhere. But Jesus' response actually was, salvation is of the Jews. In other words, God's in the temple at that time. He said there's going to come a time when you're not going to worship at Jerusalem or in the mountain. But his response was, God's in the temple, and he said, worship in the temple. And if you go somewhere else to worship him, he isn't there. That's Jesus' answer. That seems harsh. That seems uh, unbending. My friend, go ahead and call God that. How dare you? That's Jesus who said that. And Jesus said, they that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You can worship God in spirit, but the truth was that you had to worship in spirit in the temple. That's where God was. See, we think we can just, well, this is how I worship. That's a fallacy in worship. Second fallacy in worship. Uh, the first fallacy in worship is that it is worship er centered word versus God centered. No true worship centers around God and what God says is worship. It doesn't center around us. The second fallacy was that the synonym that there are, that worship has synonyms. You know what a synonym is? It's a word that has the same meaning. It's a similar word that means the same thing. And um, the oh wow uh, the problem with that is that. Worship doesn't have synonyms. For instance, I don't know what the percentage is, but high 90 percent, in the high 90 percentile, would be books that are written about worship are actually written about praise. In other words, a lot of believers, most believers think that praise and worship mean the same thing, but they don't. Praise means praise, and worship means worship. And there are seven words in the Scripture to define praise. Most books on worship talk about praise. They never mention worship. They never once mention worship. Now sometimes songs on praise mention worship. They'll say, I've come to bow down, I've come to worship. But the singers are not bowing. They're not worshiping. Because they think that worship means praise. Praise is its own word. Praise is something that is due to God. Praise is something a believer ought to do. And there are seven words Seven different meanings for the word praise. Praise has seven words and seven contexts or meanings. Only one of those words for praise is musical. Only one word out of seven. And the church is so far out of balance with regard to praise because most praise is not singing, it's not music, and yet we think that worship is praise and that praise is singing 
but one seventh, if you will, if you're going to be balanced about praising, of praise is music. Like I said, I think if most of us were to take a test, we'd fail it. If this morning you had to write the seven words for praise and define their meanings and show a context for them, how would you do? Most of us think praise is worship, and most of us think that worship is singing, or praise is singing. And or mo I, I said that the wrong way. Most of us think that worship is praise, and praise is singing. And there's an aspect of praising that is musical. Most isn't. Most isn't. We are so imbalanced in the church. Small wonder it seems that we lack the power of God. You say, Pastor, no. There are great assemblies that are having amazing worship services. Well, my friend, there are seeker-sensitive churches who are providing the experience that people desire, but that's, that is worshiper-centric or seeker-sensitive, not God-sensitive. See, we need to do away with the phrase or the notion of seeker-sensitive worship and just replace it with God-sensitive worship. God-sensitive worship. Try that one on. If I'm sensitive to God and God is holy, how ought I to come into His presence? Throw some words out. What manner, tell me, what manner should a person come into God's presence if He's holy? Loving. Okay, humbly. You said lovingly. Okay, well that would be like God. God's loving. Um, well, how would you approach a God who hates sin, who's a righteous judge for sin, who's holy? <laughs> well, okay, so with fear. Okay, there should be a fear, reverence. Yeah, okay. How about without sin? How about with clean, un clean washed hands? I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want you to think that I focus on things that don't matter as much as big things. I'm not into, into trying to work on people's behavior or trying to be a behavior modification pastor. I feel like I know men, pastors, who I think are solid doctrinally, I think are right about most of what they believe, but I think a lot of times the way that it plays out is that they are more concerned with people looking Christian than being followers of Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? Now, it's funny because we oftentimes throw out the baby with the bathwater. We say all you care about is looks, and we go the other way and say, let's don't care about looks. Well, that doesn't make any sense either, does it? A person who's holy ought to look holy, shouldn't he? Because we ought to, ought to reek of the world, of worldliness. There are behaviors, there are sins in the life of a believer. Addictions, for instance. Something that is a besetting sin. Something that controls you and you don't control it. And if we're going to worship God, we can't have that in us. I'm, just tell, I'm not trying to be unkind, but if you have a besetting sin in your life, if you're struggling with something and you have it unconfessed, I'm not saying you have to be perfect and never sin again. I'm saying if it's unconfessed and you have no intention of letting God change your life or structure your life or making you, modeling you after the image of Jesus Christ, which is ultimately what you'll be. You have no intention of change in your life. My friend, your worship is a pretense. It's a pretext. It, it, it only looks like worship. The reality of it is you cannot come before a holy God with unwashed hands. I love in... Uh, when Paul is writing to Timothy in the pastoral letters, when he talks about behaviors for church people, and he said, I would that good men of God should pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And I think that holy hands, holy hands are a prerequisite to worship, aren't they? The idea of holy means there's nothing in it. It's not hands like this. Have you seen clenched fist worship? This isn't worship. This is worship. Yes. Bow down with nothing. Nothing that I'm holding on to. Okay, so that's the second fallacy 
in worship is that worship is praise and that we can just come to God uh, any way that we wish to. And we just saw the practical application. Again, our best example for God's will and worship was the woman at the well when Jesus emphasized spirit and truth. In other words, not just the right spirit, but the right spirit in the right way, in the right place. There is a lot of redefining, isn't there? As a matter of fact, that's what I kind of want to deal with. I have a very, very simple message today uh, when we get to it here in about half an hour or so. Uh, I have a very simple message today, and it's really a definitions message. We're strugg we struggle a great deal um, with being dumbed down as believers. Let me ask you just a practical question. Do you think this morning about whether or not you learn anything in church today? You didn't have to, but I'm just, just asking you, would, would it be right for us to have the expectation that when Sunday school is taught and when uh, the Word of God is preached, that there would be more than simple application, but that there would actually be some education? Yes. We need that, don't we? We need to be educated. We need to be taught. In Christianity, we have decided... Uh, years ago, before I was born, so it's not my generation that's the fault for this. We just have piled on to it, our own error. But we decided to really dumb down everything in worship. It started by dumbing down our Bible. That's where it began. It began, we started saying, I need a dumber Bible. You say, Pastor, nobody ever said that. Yes, they did. I've heard it. I hear it all the time. It embarrasses me how often I hear it. We need a bad translation of the Scripture. They don't say it that way, but we need a bad translation of the Scripture because the good translation is too hard to read or understand. It's tragic, but it's true, that the King James Version of the Bible, it's just a translation, but the King James translation of the Bible was translated at a third grade level. Academically, it's translated at third grade. And... The problem for most of us, if you were to say, Pastor, the reason I can't read the King James Bible is because old English. there's so many words, it's not Old English. There's words that we don't know. It's not Elizabethan, that's a, that's a misnomer. And it's not Old English. But there are just words that people don't know. We don't know what they mean. And so it has been dumbed down. And you say, that's not a nice way of putting it. Somebody help me with niceness. I'm struggling today. Water. <laughs> Watered down? Okay. It's been watered down. In other words, okay, so people don't know what this word means. So let's come up with another word. The problem with it is that the word isn't equivalent. It's not the same word. Uh, the King James Bible is translated from the right text. The text that the church has always used and has always understood is the inspired word of God. Other, the other Bibles, the other modern translations, now I'm not teaching about this today, I'm just mentioning this because this is an attitude that we have. The other modern translations come from text which have been altered by people who think that the Word of God isn't perfect. They don't believe in preservation. They believe that... Here's, here's how it's written in their doctrinal statements and on most churches' websites. We believe that the Word of God is uh, inspired and preserved in the original translations. Read the average church's doctrinal statement. I'm not, I'm not making this up. In the original translation. In other words, if you ask them the question, do we have the original translations, their answer would be no, they've been lost for thousands of years. So God inspired and preserved a book that is inaccessible to us today. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? The translators of the modern versions of the Bible believe the Bible not only has mistakes, but they believe that it's impossible to know exactly what was originally written. Let me just help you with something. If you believe that God can create the world, do you? Yes. If you believe that God can give His Word, do you? Mm -hmm. Is it such a stretch to believe that God could preserve the same? If God could give a perfect book, couldn't He keep it perfect? Mm -hmm. You say, but man's altered it. I know. I know man has tried to alter it, but we've always had the preserved Word of God. And that's the heart of the issue. Now, there are facts behind it that are more sordid than seem to appear on the surface. But it is a satanic attack to undermine people, to make them think that the Word of God has error in it, and it does not have a perfect book. 
And I'll be frank with you, if the Bible isn't perfect, then I cannot know what is and is not true in it, and might as well just scrap the whole thing. It's not good for anything at all. We don't have apostles today. We don't have prophets today. And if we don't have a perfect Word of God, my friend, forget about knowing what truth is. See, it's all based on the Word of God. And so, we have, generally speaking, we have a church culture that decides that we're going to change the Bible. Or we're going to find a Bible that we prefer. If I don't know a word, instead of learning vocabulary, I'm just going to get a Bible that talks to me at my level. Now, is it important to talk to people at their level? Yes. Yes. Yes, isn't it? In other words, uh, if somebody doesn't know what a word is, why not explain what the word is? I'll be frank with you, one of the struggles as a pastor teacher for me is relating to people. It's a struggle for me. I'll be quite honest with you, academically I cannot relate to the children of today. I was privileged to be born into a family where my mom and dad trusted Jesus as their Savior and taught me the Word of God when I was a kid. And I was privileged to have a Christian education, an exceptionally good Christian education. You know, one where the academics we would have scored in the 98 percentile, uh, the, the lowest, the, the, the people that tested the lowest would have scored in a 98 percentile in the town where our Christian school was. Um, the girl in our class that scored the lowest on her ACTs um, probably scored, I want to say that she would, there were, there were only two girls in town, you know, we had a small Christian school, there were only two people in town that scored higher than the girl who scored the lowest in our school on ACTs, and we weren't brilliant kids, we were just had a good education. You know, education is not brilliant, it just means you've been taught, you've learned the things you're supposed to learn. And so as a kid, I grew up reading the Bible every day and being taught vocabulary and being taught things. And, and frankly, the kids, the average kids in our public school when they graduate as a senior, if they can read the words of a book, don't know what they mean. And that's a fact. And it's hard for me to relate to that, but it's the truth. If you get an education in the public school system, I'm not railing against the public school system today. I'm just telling you the facts. Check it out yourself. I do. I, I, have, I run into it constantly. You run into the average kid in the public school system, 75% of kids in the public school system graduate. But did you know in the state of Florida and in most states today, that does not mean be, that they graduate. It means they finished going to school enough days out of 180 each year. You don't have to pass to graduate. 70% of the 75%, I'm, I'm serious, I'm not making this up, 70% of the 75% failed all their classes and got diplomas. They don't know anything. They haven't learned anything. And uh, I'm not picking on anybody. All I'm saying is it's tough for me to relate to that. In my school, if you didn't pass, you got held back. Yeah. It used to be the way it was. If you didn't get an education, they didn't give you a paper that said you had an education. If you're an exceptional student in the public school system, you'll get put into a gifted class where you have teachers that teach kids that learn. And if you're not exceptional, you'll just be pushed through whether you pass or not. Period. That's all it is. Okay. I just want to help us with something. We think that education is everything, but most of us don't have it. And unfortunately, we approach worship on the same level. In other words, even if I don't understand worship, I'm going to do what I think worship is, and it'll be acceptable anyway. There's a mindset that we have toward worship that says worship is whatever I want it to be, and whether it is or not, it'll, it'll all work out in the end. It boggles my mind. I watch students fail every class in school and get a diploma. <laughs> we, a couple years ago, it, it, this is dying out. People are seeing the light about it a little bit. A couple years ago, if you had a football game or a basketball game, or soccer or softball, everybody got a trophy at the end of the game. Everybody gets a trophy, everybody's a winner. And whether you were or not, didn't matter how many goals you scored or didn't score, you won. We won. We all know that isn't true. And so 
This is a problem because of the way it makes us think. Now, it's laughable, it's silly, how foolish some of it is, but tragically, we look at the Word of God this way. And instead of not knowing what a word means and learning what it means, we just go with what we know and say, well, God's just going to have to accept that because that's the best I can do. God doesn't accept anything that man can do. He only accepts what Jesus does. One last thing, I'll give you our message. Don't be so frightened, I could read our message in, I don't know, 30 seconds or maybe two minutes, something like that. Uh, now that we approach worship, now that we approach the scripture that way, but we think that truth is that way as well. There are so many variations of denomination and doctrine that on the surface it's impossible to figure out who's right and who's wrong. Do the, the coexist stickers crack you up just a little bit? You, know, you ever see the coexist? They're on, they're on um, Toyota Priuses. <laughs> Except for his, he's got an Eagle sticker, a uh, whatever, a, a Philadelphia Eagle sticker on his. But Toyota Priuses have coexist stickers on them, and uh, <laughs> it's really true too. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, next time you see a Toyota Prius, look for the coexist. Not on every single one, but if you see one, they'll either have the homosexual sign, the equality, or the uh, coexist sticker on. That's like a required sticker. Uh, for most Priuses. <laughs> they have a cross, they have the Muslim sign, they have all the different religions, and then they say coexist. And the idea is, can't we all just get along? I understand it's like a peace thing, like um, stop killing each other. I'm for that. I'm for people not killing me, and if people don't kill me, I'm for not killing them. The first being a prerequisite to the second. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm for getting along, I'm for peace. But you know the, what that sticker implies that isn't true is that truth is just all a choice. In other words, you choose to be Catholic, you choose to be Muslim, you choose to be Baptist, you choose to be this or that or whatever. And uh, if we're going to worship God, we just all need to just understand it's all truth. And then there are churches, Unitarian churches, that that is their mantra. That's their worship is. Uh, you can go to Unitarian church and worship whatever God you want to. And they'll have a service to worship this and worship that and just mix it all together. The problem with that is that God is who God is. Can you imagine if someone did that to you? Gave, assigned you an identity on the basis of what they wanted you to be? instead of who you actually are. We have a lot of identity confusion, and it's because of that. Can you imagine being assigned identity on the basis of what somebody wanted to project you to be? I've heard people that know that the Bible is the Word of God and that Jesus is the only way for salvation be infiltrated a little bit with that. For instance, I've had people, when you're trying to show them what the Bible says about truth, about a doctrine, you're just saying, well, this is what the Bible says. And they say, well, my God would never. Ever had somebody say that? Well, my God is a God of love, and He just would not. Well, I know the Bible says that, but my God, what is that? Well, it's the God that they have invented in their mind. In other words, this is who I believe God is. My friend, you'd find it offensive if somebody believed things about you that aren't so. Unless they're good things. <laughs> it might be offensive anyway. And God certainly finds it offensive because He is who He is and He has revealed Himself to us. Are there things about God you cannot know? Are they in the Bible? Trick question. <laughs> are there things about God that you cannot know which are in the Bible? No, not at all. If it's in the Bible, you can know it. How is God eternal? Well, the Bible says God's eternal, but I don't know how. <laughs> he has no beginning, he has no end. How is God? How, I mean, there are things about God that if I could understand, probably I'd know how to be God. 
or I'd be on an equal level with God. A created individual will always be less than his creator. So there's just things about God I cannot know. But my friend, the things that I can know about God, I can't decide something else about. I've decided that God is the just... He is the planet. You know, it's, He's everything. He's the spirit of the trees and the people and the animals and the beasts and all these things. God is everything. God is, God is in all of us. No, God isn't in all of us. The only way God is in us is if you've received Jesus as your Savior and God's Spirit lives in you. Amen. You may have a spirit, but if, you've re if it isn't the Spirit of Christ, my friend, it's a devil. It isn't God. You can't just believe whatever you want to about God. Truth is truth, and true worship is true worship. Okay, look, we've come full circle. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And I want to look at, we, we, we started off really by referencing Isaiah seeing God in heaven. And I just want to um, read a passage in Revelation that's impressive for several reasons. First of all, it's impressive because... By the way, we're going to start a series in Revelation next Sunday morning, but this is one that I that uh, I won't be able to preach as part of that series time-wise. So I really uh, saw that it fit with this series and, and wanted to begin here. Revelation chapter 4 is actually uh, a, a solid, more than a, more than a half page in my Bible, and... Um, less than a full page, so I would say maybe just a little less than two-thirds of a page in my Bible. Is that about that for you? Let's, let's call it five-eighths of a page in my Bible. I'm not sure exactly. And what impresses me about that is that Revelation is a pretty short book of the Bible. And I'm going somewhere with this. Revelation isn't, isn't very voluminous, and Revelation is full of mysteries that are revealed. That's why it's called Revelation. Chapter 4 of Revelation fits between where John has given the introduction to the book and written the letters to, to the seven churches or been given the message for the seven churches. And it's a transition in the book, but it isn't about future events. Chapter 4 is where the present, right, the things which were, the things which are, present is are, that's the outline of Revelation. And chapter 3 is where the present tense ends. But chapter 4 doesn't really begin the future. It's a transition again. I, I'm not trying to be deep here. And I know I've gone a long time today. But I want us to understand this. It's astonishing actually that this volume of material fits in a book. When it is the same thing that you could read in Isaiah chapter 6. Because it's a description of God in heaven. The throne of God in heaven. John said, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were as of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Okay, what part of the book is it? The hereafter, the future part of the book. Again, the outline of Revelation is in Revelation. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper, that's, a, that's like a diamond, and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. This is really a sight. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And now notice the throne, because this is the same thing we see in Isaiah. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle." And the four beasts had each of them six wings round about him. You remember this from Isaiah 6? Mm -hmm. Okay. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. 
And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. And what's that next worship? Worship, worship him. Do they dance and sing and praise? Yeah. No, they fall down and worship. Him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. I want to look at three words. Glory, honor, power. The word glory. The word's dogsa. I like the word. I've, I like to, uh, when, I, when I was in college, I always like to say dogsa because people don't know what you're saying. But you're saying glory. You know what glory means? Or what, what uh, yeah, glory means? Opinion, judgment, or a view, or an opinion, or an estimate, whether good or bad, concerning someone. In the New Testament, it's always a good opinion concerning one, resulting in praise, honor, and glory, splendor, brightness of the moon, sun, and stars, magnificence, excellence, preeminence, dignity, grace, majesty, a thing belonging to God, the kingly majesty which belongs to Him as supreme ruler, majesty in the sense of the absolute perfection of the deity, a thing belonging to Christ, the kingly majesty of the Messiah, the absolutely perfect inward and personal excellency of Christ, uh, and so on. Uh, the last definition, the glorious condition of blessedness into which is appointed and promised that true Christians shall enter in after their Savior's return from heaven. Let's glorify the Lord. It begins with an estimation or a judgment of God's worth or His worthiness. And the glory belongs to God because of who He is. He is glorious. And yet when we talk about glorifying God, we very rarely boil it down to a judgment or an estimation of God's worth being superior to our worth. Of God's better than us, being better than us in our judgment. Too much of what we see or perceive as glorifying to God is perhaps more bringing ourselves onto a plane of equality rather than bringing ourselves to a place of bowing down to God. That's worship. When the elders worshiped God and they cast crowns at His feet, they declared, You're worthy, God, of glory and honor and thanks. Honor. Uh, honor. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, God is worthy of glory and honor. Tim A. It's a valuing by which the price is fixed. Of the price itself or of the price paid and received for a person or things bought and sold. Honor which belongs or is shown to one, or here's another definition, of the honor which one has by reason of rank and state of office which he holds, deference or reverence. How do you show honor to a person? Somebody visits and you're honored that they are there and you want to honor them. You have somebody at your house and you want to honor them. What do you give them to drink? Anything they want. Anything they want. The best you have, right? Yeah. The best you have. What do you give them to eat? The best. The best you have. Uh, how do you, where do you, where do you house them? What room do they get in your house? What seat at the table? What chair in the living room? The best, right? You give them the absolute best that you have. And what do you give yourself? The least. Less. In other words, if you want to honor somebody, you don't give everybody the same as you give them, right? Why does he have... Well, he's our honored guest. 
my mom actually modeled this probably inadvertently so but when we were kids you don't think terribly of my mom for this but if we had hamburgers in our house oftentimes my dad had steak in other words my dad earned the living he paid the bills and when he came home at dinner time if we had hamburger oftentimes he had a steak you say pastor that's not right you know, the kids should have steak. Hey, listen, we'd like to have had steak. That would have been fine with us. But if there was going to be a steak in our house, my dad got it. So I don't agree with that. I don't care if you agree with it or not. I'm trying to help you understand something about honor. Mm -hmm. It's the way my mom honored my dad. She said, you know what, guys? This is the provider of our household. This is, this is your father. This is my husband. And he gets the best. My dad got the best recliner. You say, well, what about your mom? Well, I don't remember. <laughs> In other words, honor is something that it's not, it's not loose or ambiguous or misunderstood. Honor is preference. Do you see that? And if we're going to give God glory and honor, we're going to give preference to Him. Seeker-sensitive prefers us. You see the difference? God-sensitive prefers Him. So much as we think is just completely acceptable... And it has nothing to do with God when it comes to worship. And then power. This is the word we get our word dynamite or uh, our word dynamite from. Dynamite is called that because of how powerful it is. And uh, it's strength or power ability, inherent power, re power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature or which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. Uh, for instance, power for performing miracles, moral power and excellence of soul, the power and influence which belongs to riches and wealth, power and resources arising from numbers, power consisting in or resting upon armies, forces, and hosts. Looking at those three words today, could I just suggest to you, I just closed my Bible, you can close yours. Can I suggest to you that God does not have the power in our worship today? Seeker-sensitive worship does not honor God and does not give Him the power, the determination. This is what you want, and this is what you get, God. For instance, let me give you for instance. I'm going I'm to get personal here, and some of you may just disagree with this, and I hope that you'll be gracious to me, because I don't think badly of you if you disagree with me about it. I just think you're wrong, and you can do the same, okay, if you have facts to support your case. All right. All um, right. Let me give you an easy illustration. Church by the Glades has had in performers like um, Justin Bieber. And uh, they've played um, Led Zeppelin intros to start up their worship service. And uh, very, very consistently have secular, uh, really kind of anti-Christian groups. Groups that are anti-God, anti-Christian. And they play that music all the time in their, in their um, worship style. Their worship music, quote worship music, imitates those genres or genres of popular culture music. Now let me just, just go back to the 1950s when rock music actually developed its own style. In other words, if you were to read the origins of rock music in the United States, rock music would have been defined by, instead of the melody uh, being precluded or, or instead of the melody following being played on a piano or on an uh, organ or a musical instrument that actually could carry a, an actual um, tone and uh, actual note, the melody followed the beat instead of the music. And um, rock music primarily uses the snare for its beat. In other words, the song starts with the drums. You know, you start with the beat, and you get the beat of the song, and then you add to it uh, a guitar, which you, usually instruments... You can have a rock band if you have drums and a guitar, or a couple, right? You can add other things. You can add an organ, you can add a piano, or but you're just going to play chords with those. You're not going to play melody. They're just going to be a... They're not going to carry an actual melody with them. They're just going to be playing rhythms of music. That's rock music. The origins of rock music are voodoo. 
mean, you just look at the origins of where rock music came from. The individuals who introduced it into the music in the 1920s in America got it from uh, watching satanic rituals of voodoo worshippers in Africa. I mean, that's a fact. I'm not making that up. That's just a fact. Okay, rock music is primarily what's played as worship in the church today. Primarily rock music, rock style of music, or music which is influenced more by the beat than it is by the melody. And you don't have to like this. Find out the facts for yourself. These are facts. And the origins of that style of music, my friend, is Satan worship. You can throw God into it, but that's not worship in truth. You can like it or dislike it. I'm not trying to argue with anybody today. I'm just trying to tell you that that isn't worship. That's right. That type of music is not worship. It is seeker sensitive, not God sensitive. Pastor, is there no place for rock music? I don't have an answer for you about that question. I have an answer for me. <clears throat> My question is, does voodoo music equal worship music? No. That's not a complicated question. In other words, is what witch doctors use to call up devils and to invite them to inhabit them to put people into a trance. Does that equate with worship of God? And if the answer is no, then what's the deal with worship? So there are many individuals, you tell them that. There are people that would walk out of a room like this this morning and slam the door because I just told you. Look it up on Wikipedia if you'd like to. Because I just told you something that's just a fact. The origins of rock music are Satan worship. I'm just telling you, that's the origin of rock music. It was a genre that was brought into, uh, originally mixed with blues and jazz and uh, changed the style of blues and jazz in America and became its own genre of rock music. And you can go to the most primitive tribes in the world where they have not been influenced by outside culture and that their music is identical when they're having a witchcraft ceremony and they're trying to conjure up demons and call up the dead. It's identical to what is being played in churches. Worship isn't all about music. Matter of fact, worship isn't music, is it? Music is one type of praise out of seven. But what of it, my friend? If worship is bowing, what impression have we in the church? What impression do we have about what worship is? And what I just want us to say to, to, to conclude to this morning is that we're so far gone, we're so ignorant and so opinionated about something we have zero experience about, actually, until you daily worship God. I mean, you have a defined time that you bow before God and see Him on the throne as holy and as a judge in heaven. Is it a slight to you to say you know nothing about worship? Until you've worshipped in truth. You don't know what worship is. As a church, I can tell you a lot about what it isn't, but until we come to a place where we worship, where corporately as a body we bow before God, all we have are opinions. And I don't care if you're singing from the hymn book or the latest Hillsong. It doesn't matter. 
It isn't worship unless it's worship. And yet, my friend, I want to tell you something. Tony will put this message on YouTube and I'm going to get slammed for it. But I just preached the Bible to you. I just told you what the Word of God said. And I just define words as they're taught in the Bible. And there will be people that will write me and email me and uh, maybe somebody make a spoof video, make memes out of me for it. I don't care. It doesn't bother me a bit. Well, it makes me cry a little bit, but only in my sleep. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're so ready to judge worship. But do we judge it on the basis of truth or do we judge it on the basis of our spiritual preference? Man's spirit, small s, Spirit. Father, thank you for what you have taught us today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be open-minded. Lord, so many times we claim that we have open minds and we're willing to listen and to hear and, and to learn, but actually if, if what we hear doesn't line up with what we want to hear, we usually are very, very close-minded. And I just pray that today you would just have your way with us. God, if we're going to worship you here today, right now in our hearts, we must bow before you. <coughs> we must ask whether these things are so. And if they're so, God, how they apply to us, how we ought to live, how we ought to practice what we've learned. God, I pray, it's my heart's desire, God, that you would bring myself and this ministry to a place of worship where we're so in awe and so in reverence of you that you receive glory and honor and praise from us because that's what we're created for. God, I pray that you would give us a thirsting and a hungering to arrive to a place where we could confidently worship you knowing that our worship is truth. Lord, I pray that you would just bring us to that place in our ministry very soon. And Lord, that you'd get the glory from it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There isn't a come forward invitation this morning. I invite you to worship God this week. That's the invitation. Would you worship God this week? And really find out what worship is. Uh, the series is has come to a conclusion. I won't be preaching on this topic uh, for a while. But um, if I could have accomplished in preaching the series what God laid on my heart, it would be that our church would come to a place of worship something that I'm deeply burdened for and something that I realize is lacking not only here but lacking just about anywhere I've ever been because I think we just don't know what worship is and if we would individually exercise worship we'd come together with the desire to worship and we would settle for nothing less than that and that's what we need as a body but I do think in some ways it's going to require a humbling of ourselves and really a transparency where we forget about those that were around and we really focus on God and forget about what other people think about us. I think, in a sense, bowing is something that is difficult for us to do because of peers. It's not so hard sometimes to bow in a private place, but in a public place, it's something that we seem to have an aversion for. And I'm praying God will bring us to a place where it would be natural for us to worship. You're dismissed.